Throughout the history of the world, there have been many mass extinctions. Usually, these are limited in size and scope, affecting only a cluster or minority of the species that exist in a particular region on the planet at any given time. But there have been five major mass extinctions that have been utterly catastrophic, that have reset the Earth's biosphere, that have involved the loss of countless species across virtually all biomes. To set the context for today's science news, I'm going to run through and summarize these five major mass extinctions in chronological order. 440 million years ago, the formation of an ancient mountain range led to mass carbon sequestration. These new rock forms absorbed CO2 out of the air, lowering greenhouse gas levels enough to cool the Earth as less heat from the sun was being trapped in the atmosphere. This led to extensive glaciation on the Gondwana supercontinent, which lowered the sea level and exposed the world's coastal marine communities, such as shallow water coral reefs, to the increasingly cold and dry air. This ultimately wiped out 85% of life in what is called the Ordovician Silurian Extinction. 365 million years ago, the late Devonian period saw plants and fungi busy at work colonizing the mineral landscape, helping erode the mineral surface, littering it with small rocks and flakes and sand. These crumbling mineral pieces, created by the growth of roots and uh, hyphae into the, the grains of rock, were washed away by rainwater into the oceans, where they happened to feed the algae and create widespread blooming events. These algal blooms consumed all the oxygen in the water and created widespread anoxic conditions that killed off tons of marine species and destabilized global food chains. Ultimately, this end Devonian extinction killed off 75% of life on Earth at the time. 253 million years ago, at the end of the Permian, the volcanoes of the Siberian Traps erupted ferociously, catastrophically destabilizing the planet's climate. Oceans absorbed huge quantities of greenhouse gases like methane and carbon dioxide and became much more acidic killing off 96% of marine life alive at the time. Terrestrial vertebrates fared a bit better, but still poorly, with 7 out of every 10 species going extinct, and their global distribution coming to a temporary end. This unimaginable event, dubbed the Great Dying, wiped out approximately 90% of all species that existed in the Permian. 201 million years ago, so about 50 million years after the Great Dying, another event occurred that wiped out 80% of the extant life. There's more scientific debate and much more evidence that's needed to conclusively determine a cause for this major mass extinction event, but it seems like paleontologists and planetary scientists and the like are leaning towards another supervolcano explanation, specifically a supervolcano that popped up along the Atlantic Ridge. And 66 million years ago, the most famous event occurred when an 8-mile-wide asteroid smashed near the Yucatan in Mexico, throwing up dust that darkened the atmosphere for years, cooling the Earth's surface temperature, and collapsing photosynthesis-dependent ecosystems, which is pretty much all of them. Smaller creatures that could burrow or fly to safe ground managed to survive, but larger, surface-bound animals like the sauropods, the other dinosaurs, and of course many large mammals were wiped out completely, along with 75% of the Earth's life. All of these major mass extinctions took long periods of time. From the day-to-day -day perspective, conditions changed relatively slowly, but ongoing processes from these slow-motion disasters would lead to the collapse of almost everything over thousands or maybe even a few million years. Even in the case of the KT extinction, the asteroid impact, where there was a blink of an eye difference between before and after, you know, yes, there were certainly species wiped out from the initial impact, but most deaths and most species extinctions actually would have occurred months or years later, as the animals froze under the ash-darkened sky or they starved from the widespread collapse of plant life, which persisted for years, even after the sky cleared and the sun came back. The point is, these mass extinction events are so destructive 
that it can take the planet many millions of years to recover the lost biodiversity and ecological complexity. Now, the reason that I'm describing these mass extinctions is because a paper has recently been published about the possibility of a sixth major mass extinction, one which is going on right now. This rather terrifying idea has had a controversial reception, but I think the science is in on this one. I'll let the abstract of the paper fill you in on the rest of the details. Quote, There have been five mass extinction events in the history of Earth's biodiversity, all caused by dramatic but natural phenomena. It has been claimed that the sixth mass extinction may be underway, this time caused entirely by humans. Although considerable evidence indicates that there is a biodiversity crisis of increasing extinctions and plummeting abundances, some do not accept that this amounts to a sixth mass extinction. Often, they use the IUCN Red List to support their stance, arguing that the rate of species loss does not differ from the background rate. However, the Red List is heavily biased. Almost all birds and mammals but only a minute fraction of invertebrates have been evaluated against conservation criteria. Incorporating estimates of the true number of invertebrate extinctions leads to the conclusion that the rate vastly exceeds the background rate, and that we may indeed be witnessing the start of the sixth mass extinction. As an example, we focus on mollusks, the second largest phylum in numbers of known species, and, extrapolating boldly, estimate that since around AD 1500, possibly as many as 7.5 to 13% of all 2 million known species have already gone extinct orders of magnitude greater than the 882, or 0.04%, on the red list. We review differences in extinction rates according to realms. Marine species face significant threats, but although previous mass extinctions were largely defined by marine invertebrates, there is no evidence that the marine biota has reached the same crisis as the non-marine biota. Island species have suffered far greater rates than continental ones. Plants face similar conservation biases as do invertebrates, although there are hints that uh, they may have suffered lower extinction rates. There are also those who do not deny an extinction crisis, but accept it as a new trajectory of evolution, because humans are part of the natural world. Some even embrace it, with a desire to manipulate it for human benefit. We take issue with these stances. Humans are the only species able to manipulate the Earth on a grand scale, and they have allowed the current crisis to happen. Despite multiple conservation initiatives at various levels, most are not species-oriented, certain charismatic vertebrates accepted, and specific actions to protect every living species individually are simply unfeasible because of the tyranny of numbers. As systematic biologists, we encourage the nurturing of the innate human appreciation of biodiversity, but we reaffirm the message that the biodiversity that makes our world so fascinating, beautiful, and functional is vanishing unnoticed at an unprecedented rate. In the face of a mounting crisis, scientists must adopt the practices of preventative archaeology and collect and document as many species as possible before they disappear. All this depends on reviving the venerable study of natural history and taxonomy. Denying the crisis, simply accepting it and doing nothing, or even embracing it for the ostensible benefit of humanity are not appropriate options and pave the way for the Earth to continue on its sad trajectory towards a sixth mass extinction." Unquote. All right, so the full paper is available to read, and I definitely recommend it. To paraphrase, the authors explain what the sixth mass extinction is, i.e. what that means and what evidence we would need to determine if it is indeed happening or not. Then, the authors explore the many counter-arguments to the idea of an emergent mass extinction event. Much of this involves the analysis of data sources, like the value and representative accuracy of certain statistics and the limitations of certain methodologies. As you gleaned from the abstract there, they specifically discuss the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List, uh, they call it flawed and not accurately representative of the true scale of species diversity or species loss. For example, the Red List doesn't adequately analyze and evaluate more than a small fraction of invertebrate species, and underestimates species loss among these under-evaluated groups, like mollusks and less charismatic insect species. 
The list also doesn't take into account species that go extinct before they're even discovered, which famous biologist E.O. Wilson called sentinelin extinctions. The authors argue that the red list is, due to limitations in methodology and logistical practicality, necessarily a massive underestimate of the true rate of species loss and extinction, and thus it can't be used as convincing evidence against the claim that a sixth mass extinction is beginning. Beyond the IUCN's red list, the authors also address other methods of evaluation and estimation of species loss and identify additional methodological limitations that also suggest underestimation. The authors then evaluate the many understudied mollusk species who may hold great representative value in accurately estimating rates of species loss, especially among invertebrates. They also discuss extinction rates among island species, marine species, and plants, including the limitations of certain sources and methodologies, and the truth revealed by more accurate analyses. They wrap up the paper with a section on what to do now, in the face of uh, certain anti-science cultural attitudes, the general socio-political climate, and the consequences of incorrectly labeling a species extinct or not. For example, if you label a species extinct, and then some years down the line a specimen is found alive and well, which would imply the existence of uh, perhaps a larger population of this so-called extinct animal, well, that makes the, uh, the agency, the biological organization, the, the science foundation, wherever it happens to be that's making these declarations of extinction or not, it makes them look like fools. It undermines their authority on this subject. And so there's, there's a political cost to this kind of thing. It's, it's very sensitive. And that's why the authors, they, they felt like they had to talk about this. They had to make note of anti-science cultural attitudes and socio-political climates that are not conducive to properly funding scientific endeavors. And if you, if you mislabel a species extinct, it's discovered later and your institution is made to look like fools if your reputation is tarnished in that sense, well, all of a sudden, it's going to be a lot harder for even sympathetic politicians to lobby for funding for your organization. Funding goes down, research goes down, our knowledge of the natural world goes down. It can potentially be a disaster, and that's, that's why a lot of this stuff is politically sensitive. With supporting evidence, the authors argue that perhaps the most constructive course of action for us now is to invest more people and resources into the natural sciences, so that we have the, uh, the capacity to properly catalog our dwindling biodiversity before it disappears forever. The authors conclude the paper with a list of five outcomes from their analysis, and I'll use them now to conclude this news segment. Again, I really recommend you read this paper. It's very readable, it's super fascinating, and it could not be more important. So with that said, the five outcomes of their analysis with respect to the possible emergence or beginning of a sixth mass extinction event caused by humans are, quote, one, the sixth mass extinction of Earth's biodiversity, distinct from previous such events because it is caused by human activities, has been acknowledged by many for at least 30 years. We define this crisis for biodiversity as including all anthropogenic extinctions since modern humans expanded out of Africa between 200,000 and 45,000 years ago, although extinction rates now are much greater than they were at the start. Yet some deny that there is a crisis, based on two primary critiques. One, the claim that estimated extinction rates have been exaggerated, and that the current extinction rate is not significantly greater than the natural background rate. And two, that because humans are part of the natural world, human-caused extinctions are a natural phenomenon, a part of the evolutionary trajectory of life on Earth. Outcome 2. We counter these arguments by showing that current extinction rates, notably in terrestrial invertebrates, are far higher than background extinction rates. We also show that use of IUCN Red List extinction data to determine current extinction rates inevitably leads to dramatic underestimation of rates, except for birds, mammals, and perhaps amphibians. Red list data have been used inappropriately by some to deny that there is a crisis, and as humanity has the power of choice, we further argue that a laissez-faire attitude to the current extinction crisis is morally wrong. Outcome 3. We review alternative approaches for assessing extinctions, focusing on the need to address invertebrates and argue that mollusks have significant advantages among invertebrates because of their shells, which remain after death as a permanent record, while most other invertebrates vanish without a trace, 
and would therefore never be known had they not been collected prior to going extinct. We note, however, the not insignificant body of work on fossil insects. We review our own studies of extinction in mollusks and by logical extrapolation conclude that 7.5 to 13% of all 2 million known species may have already gone extinct since around 1500. This is orders of magnitude greater than the 882 or 0.04% listed as extinct by IUCN. Outcome 4. We briefly discuss the marine realm and conclude that many marine species face significant threats, which continue to increase, but we also conclude that there have been relatively few extinctions and that there is no evidence that the sixth mass extinction has already involved the marine biota. Plants, however, face many of the threats faced by terrestrial animals and suffer from similar conservation biases as do invertebrates, although there are hints that they may have suffered lower rates of extinction. And Outcome 5. The prognosis for the survival of a large proportion of extant species is not good. Our reviews lay out arguments clearly demonstrating that there is a biodiversity crisis, quite probably the start of the sixth mass extinction. Dedicated conservation biologists and conservation agencies are doing what they can, focused mainly on threatened birds and mammals, among which some species may be saved from the extinction that would otherwise ensue. But we are pessimistic about the fate of most of the Earth's biodiversity, much of which is going to vanish without us ever knowing of its existence. Denying the crisis, accepting it and doing nothing about it, or embracing it and manipulating it for the fickle benefit of people defined no doubt by politicians and business interests is an abrogation of moral responsibility." Unquote. All right, so there you have it. This is an analysis on the fact or fiction of the sixth mass extinction. So what do you think? What are your takeaways from this? My takeaways, I think, line up pretty much one-to-one -one with the researchers here. I think that current methodologies used to estimate species loss are flawed and end up with vast underestimations. I think the current rate of species loss of species extinction is way too high, particularly invertebrates like insects and soil-dwelling arthropods and invertebrates of various types. And while I agree with the author's suggested course of, uh, course of action, I also share their pessimism. We do need more people going into the natural sciences. We do need more people cataloging species, studying animals and plants and fungus and, and all the living things of our world, cataloging them and trying to find ways to preserve them so that we can maintain what dwindling biodiversity we have left. All of this stuff is incredibly important because if we cross a threshold or a tipping point where there, there's no feasible recovery, that will be an unambiguous clue that the sixth major mass extinction has officially begun. As for us today, right now, it looks like we are in the beginning stages of the sixth mass extinction. It looks like this is a thing that's getting started and that's going to keep going and perhaps persist for thousands of years. Even if humans are wiped out by our own pollution and our own violence, it's going to take millions of years for the world to recover from us. It's going to take millions of years for the world to re-evolve the biodiversity and ecological complexity that existed before humans spread out of Africa some 200 to 300,000 years ago. What does this mean for the future? What does this mean for our children who may live to see the day when the sixth mass extinction becomes official and formally recognized? What will that world look like for them? What will their ecology do for them? No matter how I think about it, the answers are always extraordinarily bleak. And that just makes me more motivated to work on what we can do now, which is encourage people to become scientifically literate, encourage people to go into the sciences, to study the sciences, to study life, and to catalog the life and protect the life that we have so that we can try and nip this in the bud, so that we can right this wrong before it gets any worse, so that we can preserve a world with life worth inheriting to give to our children and all those who come after us.